Welcome everyone. Housing Wire is excited to host this debate today where the topic is, are home prices going to crash? We have two distinct viewpoints today, so let me introduce our speakers. First, we have Housing Wire's lead analyst, Logan Motoshami, who writes the weekly housing market tracker and is a frequent guest on and contributor on CNBC, the New York Times, and the Washington Post. Our other guest today is Greg Cranin. He's the chief economic strategist of Golden Coast Consultants. Greg has a unique take based on the principles of the Austrian School of Economics, which prioritizes determining product value and consumer utility. Our format today is that each speaker will have a few minutes to present their thesis, then we'll jump into questions and they will be um, they will be talking to each other and they will also be answering questions from the audience. So feel free to add yours by clicking on the Q&A button on your screen. Greg, Logan, excited to have you here. Thank you, Sarah. It's wonderful to be here, Sarah. <laughs> this is a great day. I believe this is your birthday, Logan. Yes, it is. I turned 48 and I just think that there's, I always thought there was a rule that Austrian economic people have to be over 50. So this is a first time for me to see someone uh, uh, this young believing in this system, which is good. You have to believe in your models and, and uh, no matter what age you're in. Okay. Well, I know this is a highly anticipated debate. Um, so let's go ahead and jump in. And Greg, I'm going to give you, I'm going to go to you first for your thesis. Great. Thank you, Sarah. So first off, in my lifetime, the US dollar has lost 98% of its purchasing power. At Golden Coast, our thesis is that this long-term trend will continue, meaning that real assets and essentials like food, energy, and shelter will be higher in the long run. But with that long-term trend comes short-term price volatility. And with that short-term price volatility usually comes from the Federal Reserve. With the Federal Reserve raising the interest rates to 5.5% this year and possibly even higher, I think that they're going to be sending the US economy into a recession, which we're currently seeing unfold out right now. And a bystander of this will be the real estate market, which will most likely see price declines uh, within the next 12 to 24 months as the US enters, enters a recession. All right, Greg, thank you so much for that. Um, Logan, you have about two minutes to give us your thesis. We are here, August 31st. National home price indexes are at all time highs again, right? I believe that. The inventory channels in America have changed after 2010. The demographics of housing is good. Uh, unfortunately, though, that cost us with the most massive increase in home prices in a very short amount of time. But because inventory channels have changed in America after the qualified mortgage laws have been put into place, the housing cycle needs to be looked at in a more modern day uh, uh, economic view. And it also explains the craziness we saw in 2022 to 2023 to try to understand why did home prices get back to all-time highs when we had the biggest one-year sales crash ever in history. I will make my point today. Okay, so as we can see, we have two uh, very distinct viewpoints, which uh, is going to make for a great debate. So let's get to it. Let's start with where we are in the economic cycle, because you both referenced that. So where are we as far as going into a recession? Um, is there going to be a soft landing? And uh, Logan, let's start with you, and then we'll go to Greg. Well, my sixth recession red flag model officially went off on August 5th, 2022. But there are variables within that model to get us to the next stage, which is when jobless claims breaks, the cycle's over. Some of the things that were impacting the US economy last year were getting better. Of course, the growth rate of inflation fall, real wages are picking up. Uh, the housing market stabilized. This has allowed this cycle to keep on continuing forward. Right now, it's all about the labor market. Labor market dynamics are different now, right? Uh, the baby boomers are leaving. They need to be replaced. So the structural uh, uh, labor pool is going to be much different to break compared to other cycles in the past. So all I'm doing right now is looking at job openings, jobless claims, and what could get us over to that level. Of course, job openings are getting weaker, but we're still near 9 million. So one day, one economic report at a time, we will get to that next point. But as of right now, we're just not there yet. Greg. Yeah, so you bring up a couple of good points, Logan. Uh, I actually think that you and I actually agree on quite a few things, actually. So I agree with you that the jobless claims and the unemployment is obviously a huge factor. But we all know that that always happens at the end of knowing when the U.S. economy is officially in the recession when by that point it's always too late so you know as we're both trying to forecast and model those things out you know there can always be some uh, lags as you mentioned 
And with the Federal Reserve raising the interest rates to five and a half percent and possibly even higher, it's being priced into at least one more price hike to five and a half to five and three quarters. Uh, that's going to put more pressure on the banks and that's going to continue to keep credit tightening going on, which will affect obviously companies when they need to refinance their debt. Obviously, bankruptcies are at the highest year to date. I think there's been over 400 uh, corporate U.S. bankruptcies this year, uh, the highest since 2010. So that's usually an, an indicator that the economy's in a recession as we were in 2010 or coming out of one. Uh, but the year is still ongoing and, and bankruptcies are still continuing to rise. And obviously, if companies are going bankrupt, what does that mean? It means people are not working as they have to get laid off. So as those bankruptcies continue to rise, that means unemployment is going to continue to rise. Now, if we look at unemployment uh, continuing claims, uh, it rose about 2% on a week over week basis. So the initial claims uh, was down, but continued claims is starting to rise. So that's something to that new trend is starting to pick up and something to be a weary on, is especially as service packages start to roll off and people start to apply for unemployment that they couldn't of uh, earlier in the year. You know, I think one thing with Greg and I, we are both uh, Fed won't pivot people. Um, we might have different reasons for it. For me, again, the Federal Reserve has talked about attacking the labor supply. They wanted the labor supply to get less tight. Of course, job openings got to 12 million. They prefer it at 7 million. Um, I don't believe in the Fed pivot until jobless claims breaks over uh, 323,000 on the four-week moving average. When we get to that point, then we could start going to the uh, the R word, uh, recession. It's taking longer than a lot of people thought. Again, labor, mar labor market dynamics are different, but also household balance sheets are different. And a lot of consumer debt and corporate debt are actually tied to uh, longer term rates. Uh, so the major defaults that we would see maybe in, 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 in another duration cycle where things would have shorter durations on fixed debt is different now. And I think that has kept the thing, has kept the cycle going longer than what people thought. You will see stress in the credit data as we've seen in credit cards, auto loans, but to break that jobless claims data, we still need more demand destruction. Uh, and, and it's the, you know, trying to thread the needle for the Federal Reserve at this point, of course, maybe one more rate hike. But then after that, we'll see how it goes. And this is why it's always key to focus on one data point at a time, one week at a time to get to that level to where claims breaks over 323,000. So I want to uh, zero in here on home prices. And Greg, let me go to you first. What are the factors that that you believe will bring home prices, you know, uh, not just like moderate, but but crash or bring them down? And maybe you could define what that looks like to you. Like, what do you say is like if you saw home prices crashing, do you have a, a percentage? What does that mean to you? Yeah, well, see, here's the thing, though, as far as uh, prices go, you have nominal and then you have adjusted for inflation. So those are two different things. Now, because we're in a fiat monetary system, you know, the Federal Reserve can come out tomorrow and announce that they're going to be buying a trillion dollars worth of mortgage backed securities to bring down the mortgage rates. Now, your home price may go up, but so will the cost of bread, so will the cost of energy. So it's a, you know, net net zero. If you actually look at the money supply, uh, when the Federal Reserve printed uh, a very funny four trillion, four trillion dollars uh, back in March of 2020. Uh, that was about a 30% increase in supply of money. At the same time, real estate prices also increased about 25% on that increase of money supply. Now, when you look at M2 money supply, what has it done? It's gone down. Now, even though the S&P Schiller Index re reported a 0% gain from last year, prices are still at the record high, say, from last year, they haven't gone up. M2 money supply has declined. Now, when you look at the S&P, Schiller, 10 city and 20 city index, those prices are down. The 20 index is down about 2% and the 10, index, 10 city index is down about 1% on a year over year basis. The M2 money supply has decreased by about 5%. So you can see that when the money supply peaked in 2022, housing prices peaked. Now they may have not gone down drastically, but they stopped going up. And if the M2 money supply continues to go down or decrease, which the Fed is pretty keen on on bringing down the money supply due to QT, uh, that's gonna keep housing pressure or housing price pressure to the downside in the future. And when you look at the bubble markets for the regional bubble markets, uh, they're starting to see those price declines already. So cities like Austin, San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Seattle, Phoenix, uh, those are all uh, experiencing housing price declines. 
Uh, Logan? So M2 money supply is something I never uh, uh, track or look at because to me, uh, the housing market is based on 30-year fixed debt products, buyers and sellers. Sellers are buyers as well. After 2010, the qualified mortgage law has basically made sure that everyone who gets a loan is somewhat legit. There's non-QM loans, but even those loans do not have uh, exotic loan debt structures. If you look at the history of US economics, especially toward housing, there's a natural equilibrium between supply and demand for four decades, right? Usually, if we're going to use the NAR data, the active listings are between two to two and a half millions. The one time in history that we've deviated from that, the one time in history that we actually saw big nominal home price declines, was the spike from 2005 to 2007, right? We had what I call sellers that could not buy homes. So we had a supply crash to the upside because we had a credit boom. We never had any of that now. So even though we had the biggest home sale crash ever recorded in history, inventory really didn't grow much, right? We're now nowhere close to the four decade average. Because of that, we are in a system to where we have low active listings, new listings data trending at all time lows, and currently stable demand. There is no time in history over the last 200 years where you can have stable demand and low active listings and low uh, total listings and low monthly supply to have any kind of big nominal home price crashes. It, two variables have to break. Either home sales crash again, or the, uh, the seller becomes buyer, you get stress in the system and you get supply to come up. And if that happens with duration, then you have something. Well, what occurred last year was, you know, if you're tracking housing, you got to track the 10-year yield right? Forget about the Fed, forget about the Fed funds rate right? M2. Whatever the 10-year yield goes, the mortgage rates tends to follow. Even though we have a extreme bad spreads, they still run with each other. It's the slow dance I talk about. So the 10-year yield needs to go higher. It needs to go higher for longer. And then if you create a job loss recession and then the 10-year yield doesn't go down, similar to maybe to a degree of what happened in the late 70s, then you have a backdrop, a format to get some kind of nominal home price decline of value with duration. We just haven't seen anything of that yet. We saw an explosion in prices in early 22. Then we had the biggest mortgage rate increase ever in history in a very short amount of time. We had the biggest home sale crash and then it all changed, right? November 9th. I always talk about November 9th for a reason. Then you have to start tracking weekly housing data, inventory, pending sales, forward-looking sales, purchase application data. Until you see a break of demand or supply, we're stuck here, right? Affordability is the worst ever, but we're stuck here. To get big nominal home price declines, you've got to have those two variables break. Either demand has to break, supply has to break higher, or both of them happen together. So Great. I would throw that back to you, Greg, and, and ask you yeah. specifically about inventory, because that's what we're getting a lot of um, in the chat. A lot of people are talking about inventory that like, to Lo to Logan's point, if, if you're going to have a significant, you know, price decrease, if you're going to see prices crash, there has to be more supply than there currently is, because right now, you know, I mean, the average uh, time on market is still in the teenager level. So hand it back to you to, to answer that. Great. So as far as supply and demand goes, let's keep to keep go back to basic econ 101, right? So if demand has now plummeted, if I remember back to levels of like 1990s, like 28 years, record low of demand and supply and supply stays constant, well, what happens to price? And as far as demand goes, you need the economy to actually pick up. So if we're not adding more jobs, if salaries aren't going higher, where is the demand going to increase to buy the current supply on the market? So if we're if Logan and I are both right or or hinting towards that the Fed won't pivot until the labor market breaks, that means that demand will not be coming back. That means if anything, demand is going to fall. And in that case, the 10 year might actually do fall below 4%, may actually have below three and a half percent. That's because we're heading to a recession. And then even though the lower interest rates will actually won't boost demand because you'll have more people unemployed. And this is actually what happened in 2008. So take out all the credit nonsense. Basic thing is that interest rates went down from 2008 to 2012. Housing went down with the lower interest rates. And why was that? Because demand went away. So if unemployment rises because of the Fed raising the interest rates, demand goes away even further than what it already is today. So even though it's inventory can remain exactly where it's at right now, that means if demand goes to zero, then who's going to buy those homes? So now that's being a little exegetious, but 
you know, that's where, where I stand with that. So let's talk about the 2008 housing credit models. We had a massive sale boom. We had a massive sale bust, except one problem. The inventory channels broke in five, six, and seven. The inventory level listings actually peaked in 2007. 2008, then the housing recession and the general recession happened after that. So even though the 10-year yield and mortgage rates were falling, it doesn't matter because it was a credit boom to a credit bust. The credit availability index from 2005 peaked at 900 if you're using the MBA index. That collapsed all the way down to 100. It's gone nowhere for over 12 years. What I would say is that we've had many cycles where we're in a recession and you have buyers. I would argue at this point, we have over 156 million people working. At this point to where sales are, and for all my work, a lot of people who know me, it's really rare to go under 4 million after 1996, just because the civilian workforce is so big. Our household demographics right now are much better than they were in 2000. In fact, 2008, the population growth were prime age uh, people peak. That was a really big deal. Here, ages 28 to 35 are the biggest. I call them replacement buyers, demands. You put move up buyers, move down buyers, cash buyers, investors, first time home buyers together. You have that concentrated 4 million uh, buyer profile. So if the 10 year yield falls, it really is based on, well, out of that 156, 157 million people that are working, if we lose two to three million people, my army is bigger than yours still. It's got 153 million people that are sitting and waiting for rates to fall. That's why I always say that if the recession happens, a, 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 a creative model would be that the 10-year yield doesn't fall or mortgage rates don't fall enough because we got a little whiff of what happened November, December, and January when the when mortgage rates just went down to 5.99%. We had stabilization and growth in demand. That's why I'm saying is, can we have this happen again with sales so low? If we're running at six and a half million, that's different, right? You have leeway all the way down to 4 million, but we're here already. So the question is when the recession happens, if the 10 year yield falls, if mortgage rates fall with still 156 million people working, is that enough to keep demand stable? That's why I always say stable demand, low inventory. Now, let's say we get an escalation of supply, right? Sellers that sell their homes because of forced liquidation, right? Forced credit sellers, as I talk about. True, but let's say 2.6 million uh, people lose their jobs. Half of them are renters, right? The other half, dual household incomes, low total housing costs, uh, unemployment benefits. Can they keep things at bay until they get their jobs back? That's why when we have the recession happen, we track new listings, active listings, 10-year yields, purchase applications. All these variables come together that we do here at Housing Wire because it's not going to be the 2008 to 2012 model where we've had this massive credit boom, right? Didn't matter what mortgage rates were, right? Exotic loan debt structures kept the debt that high. When it collapses, it doesn't matter what rates do. But we're already here at very low levels. Now, we're not at the lows that we saw in 2008. I think that was around about 3.78. But we could even head down there and then there it is, right? 156 million plus people working, lower mortgage rates, credit stable. If something had happened to Freddie and Fannie, that changes everything. But Freddie and Fannie are still in conservatorship. That's why I always say that the unsung hero of COVID, right? COVID had 20 to 30 million people unemployed. We had 5 million in forbearance. We took off 35 million people and why did I write the COVID-19 recovery model on April 7th, 2020? Because we still had 133 million people working. Housing demand recovered seven weeks, right? So that was different because mortgage rates were lower then. So I think the, the, the where it's going to get interesting is, can mortgage rates come down low enough to offset the job loss recession or the supply? Now, foreclosure supplies is not going to be fast, right? Because we're 30, 60, 90 day late or running at all time lows, it's going to take time, right? Minimum nine to 12 months off of that first 30 day. In a lot of states, it's 12 to 18 months. So it has to come from forced equity sellers. That's going to be the battle. So when the job loss recession happens, focus on the 10 year yield, focus on purchase application, focus on new listings, focus on active listings, all these things that have run with housing cycles for decades. Each cycle will be unique and different. This next one will be as well, but we know for sure, 156 million people working, 4 million sales already, and the best credit profile we've ever seen in history. Thank you. Right. Uh, 
Greg, I, I definitely want you to answer. I just um, want to make sure that we're uh, definitely very focused on how is it that you think that, um, you know, where is that supply coming from? Do you think it's foreclosure? Do you think it's Airbnb? You know, like, where do you see supply coming? Supply can be coming from a lot of different places. Uh, one of them is actually from the baby boomers. I know that a lot of baby boomers have two homes. Uh, depending on what happens in the future with inflation, baby boomers may want to actually sell one of their homes uh, to raise cash. And that can also increase supply. And if you also try and see, well, why, why how can supply rise? Uh, Austin is no greater city to, as an exhibit of how supply of housing is actually now at a record high. So if you actually look at Austin real estate market, there's actually now more housing available in Austin for sale than ever before. And how is it that Austin prices are also down 15% when supply is rising? So obviously there's no demand there. And obviously that's a clear sight. Going back to California, we have the seven, as a lot of people know, the Magnificent Seven. These seven stocks are basically carrying the global stock market. Why is it that San Francisco and the tech area is experiencing housing price declines? So that obviously tells you something that the economy where the tech boom currently is, is not benefiting from the companies. And that's trickling now into the actual economy. As you can see, I think San Francisco on the K. Schiller report this week uh, was down 10% year over year. So if the tech bubble in the tech boom is doing so well, you wouldn't be expecting real estate prices to be falling uh, in these key demographics that are also supposed to be uh, leading uh, indicators on how well the economy is doing. And so when supply comes, it could be also from a different things. Um, but that doesn't, real estate doesn't drive how everything happens. It's credit. And if you look at credit in the banks, right now they're pulling off credit. So you, uh, according to the most recent slow report from the Federal Reserve, uh, tightening uh, standards have increased drastically. The banks are pulling back. Also, the banking sector is still not out of the banking crisis from the Silicon Valley bank mess that happened in March. If you look at the discount window from the Federal Reserve, uh, it hit over $70 billion in the most recent quarter. So, and the Jerome Powell actually encouraged all banks to go to the discount window. Now, there is obviously financial stress going on in the banking sector. That's also kind of being like swept away right now. We're not being talked about because that would scare people. But if you also look at the bank term funding program, the BTFP by the Federal Reserve just hit a record high. We'll get that data after this uh, uh, debate today to see if it continues to hit a record high. Now, what is the bank term funding program? Meaning the banks are actually underwater on their assets. So when talking about a credit risk, the banks are sitting on tons and tons of toxic assets. And what is toxic assets? It means that they held a lot of mortgage-backed securities. If you look at the ABX, it's currently down 20% because their mortgages that they hold on their balance sheet lost 20% in value because of the higher interest rates. This is actually more reminiscent of the savings and loan crisis of 1980s than it does more of the 2008 financial crisis. So with that credit stress, uh, with higher interest rates, higher inflation, uh, without a handle on inflation, there could be more credit stress in the market in the future. And that could put more significant pressure on the economy causing that recession and then eventually causing more supply to come on the market if people need to raise cash uh, from selling their assets, basically. I would just want to jump in here real quick. We do have a um, some things uh, from the chat, and I know that Logan probably wants to jump in as well. But several people are pointing out that, you know, Austin's a pretty um, different market. And and when we just did a, a story this week on um, median home prices in Austin, so a home in Austin uh, reached a peak of 675000 in April of 2022. Um, by April 2023, that figure had dropped by 14% to a median sale price of 580. And as of August, that is now 569. But when you when you compare that to 2019, the median average is 393. So, I mean, if we're going to see a crash and a, a really meaningful one, Greg, in, in your opinion, how far do prices have to fall for it to be a crash? Because we're so far off of what's normal, even in a, a market like Austin, that it's hard to imagine that we're going to get back down to those those levels. Well, the medium indexes uh, over the, the quarter of recorded history, none of them go down more than 20 percent. So as far as what the max downside would be, would be on those indexes would be 20 percent. Never on any of those indexes over the course of time have gone down more than 20 percent. 
But I can tell you for sure, because I actually bought one of those distressed real estate properties after 2008 in San Diego. Uh, one of those homes uh, sold for almost 40% lower than what it sold. I bought a brand new high rise in San Diego uh, after uh, everything came down after 08. And it was a 40% discount on where it was in 2008. Uh, and I sold it above where it was selling at in 2008. So when you look for adjusted for inflation, uh, if you held that house from 2008, you'd only be about you know 8% beating out inflation. If you look at what the average, now, if you just take away all the risks that we're talking about today and just say that real estate will just continue its path higher, which I'm a long-term believer that real estate assets will be higher 20 and 30 years from now. That doesn't mean that short-term price volatility can't happen. So the average home has gone up 4% or averages 4%. If you actually look at the average inflation rate since 1971, it's 4%. So average home prices are just going up and keeping up with inflation. And then when you have certain cycle peaks and certain uh, credit busts, you can have uh, price declines. And there's nothing wrong with that. Now, from the peak, or I'm sorry, from the bottom of 2009, home prices rose a lot. That was great for people who bought after 2009. There's nothing wrong with that. But inflation at the same time since 2009 has been about 60%. So in the same time, you're combating inflation. Now there's a lot of different things going on right now in the market. So when you're looking at interest rates, the mortgage rate today is 7%. Let's go with the median home price of 400000 So that means you're going to have to pay a bank $500,000 of interest if you take out a 30-year fix for 400000 at the current 7% interest rate. Why would I want to take out four hundred thousand and then pay the bank five hundred thousand? Meaning the bank gets to double their money in seven years. When it could take me at an average rate of four percent, it's going to take me eighteen years for me to double my money. Now, the current twenty-year bond yields four and a half percent. That means if I buy that bond today at four and a half percent, I can double my money in sixteen years. That's a little bit better of a return, knowing that it's a guaranteed 4.5% return for the next 20 years. And when home prices only go up 4% annually, it's really not a good deal because now you're dealing with a lot of the risks that we're talking about today. So, so let me, uh, let me let Logan in there uh, real quick. Let, let him answer. Go ahead, Logan. Um, I just think that's, that's a very good uh, statement for a, an investor. But um, the hedge against inflation was actually the 30-year fixed payment itself. Uh, and what's occurred right now is that after 2010, everyone pretty much got vanilla government guaranteed loans or insured loans, fixed debt cost rising wages. So what occurred is we haven't dealt with inflation breaking out for decades. Uh, Greg, I don't even think was born back in the 70s. So uh, a homeowner is hedged not only against inflation itself, but just because your wages rise more during an inflationary period. It's also hedged against an aggressive Federal Reserve. So all the points Greg just made shows you why people are chilling in their homes, right? Uh, homeowners are living in their homes longer and longer from 1985 to 2007. It was five to seven years, different credit channels back then from 2008 to 2023, depending on who you listen to 11 to 13 years, a lot of cases, uh, 18 to 20 years, I'm going to be living in my home for 20 years uh, next April. So people have a very low fixed payment, not only to fight against inflation, but fight against the total cost of living rising by the Federal Reserve dragging interest rates up. So we have all seen what's happened. Active listings still haven't broken out yet, really, in any meaningful way. So if it's going to be a distressed situation, right, credit getting tighter can happen on the, on, on the high end, right? There's 108,000 cities in America. There's 12 cities that are tied maybe to the high tech industry that are or high prices that are seeing a weakness. The jumbo market can be impacted credit there. That is a viable concept. But everywhere else, the credit flows just because Freddie and Fannie are still in conservatorship. If they weren't FHA, VA, if they if these were publicly traded companies or anything, we have a whole different discussion right now, but they're not. So credit is flowing like it did during COVID. It's all about the 10-year yield. If the 10-year yield can fall and sales are low, think about this, 156 million people working, how many job losses, how many of them are homeowners, where are rates? Can demand stay stable around 4 million during this process? When that time comes, we can get there. Another, another topic could be that home sales take off before the recession happens, and then we come back down again. 
But as long as we're down here at these very low levels, uh, we we have to focus more on the 10-year yield than credit just because Freddie and Fannie run the show here. It's not like the exotic loan debt structures that we've had in, in the start of the century where anybody can put their homes on the market. That's why inventory was growing back in 2000 and 2005. People forget active listings were growing during that period. We had a major sales boom and a sales credit bust. We don't have that right now. That's why we're in a sense we're stuck here, right? Uh, and it's going to be a grinding fist fight every day and week. But when the recession comes, it'll take a whole new conversation. And I cannot wait for that one just because I think we have to go even more in depth to the weekly active listings data. So, so I just want to say, uh, Logan, as far as the recession goes, uh, it sounds like you're actually like in, in my camp that that seems like a high possibility that will happen. But I just want to say that the recession that possibly comes, unless the Federal Reserve gets serious about taming inflation, uh, that this could be more of a stagflation. And maybe housing prices don't go down, but every year the core inflation came out today was 4.5%. So when you have core inflation running at 4.5%, but you know real estate prices are the same price as they were last year, your home just lost 4% in value towards inflation. So now it's starting to become a risk to inflation. Because remember, there's only so many people that can borrow money to buy homes, right? There's only so many credit worthy people to buy homes. Now there's always people with cash out there, but that's not going to move the needle in the housing market. So if the Federal Reserve is actually serious about getting inflation back to their target of 2%, uh, it's going to be either very painful. Now, if they stop interest rates and they pause and they stop at five and a half percent, and then in core inflation just stays at four and floats to five and then goes back down to four and st starts to five, you know, that's the stagnation. And no one wants stagnation is actually the worst thing because everyone just feels miserable at, at that point. And then there's really no demand because every day, every year, the price of our everyday goods of food and energy just keep going up and up, not by a lot, but just eats away at that purchasing power. And that just squeezes the middle class, which is what you need to actually get housing to go up in value drastically again. Until those scenarios play out, you know, I just don't see the big upside from today on a short-term period, unless the Federal Reserve comes out and, you know, prints, you know, a couple more trillion dollars. Uh, but other than that, if they let free markets work, I don't think that that's a, today is actually a great time to be purchasing a house. And I don't think that prices will be rising anytime, especially since the Fed is fighting inflation. The last thing the Fed wants is housing prices just went up 10% this year. And if that is the case, they're probably going to have to raise rates even higher if that was to happen. So, which means they're going to be putting more pressure on everything else in the economy. So I just don't think those scenarios, uh, based on what the Federal Reserve is trying to do, is such a good thing going forward. Now, the only other time that housing just went up with the rise of interest rates was in 1970s. And so during that stagflation, housing did double, but the value of the dollar lost 50% in that same time period. So yes, it was a safe haven in an in, in, in inflation hedge, but those issues are a little bit different than what we're facing uh, today. Logan, your response? Um Greg, does it sound like you're you're in the camp that it's going to be uh, real home prices falling more than nominal? It I, because I it depends because I don't know what the Federal Reserve is going to do now. If I if we knew that the Federal Reserve was not interfering in the market, buying Treasury bills at weekly bond auctions, uh, we know they're doing QT right now, where you see you can pull up their Fed's balance sheet and they're reducing their mortgage-backed security holdings, they're reducing their Treasury holdings. Now, if there was an event, I don't know, another 9-11, another COVID, and, the, and everyone's in panic, and the Fed says, oh, we need to print another $5 trillion, everybody, well, then, yeah, uh, housing prices won't go down. But if it's just more of a uh, 2008 or maybe like a savings and loan crisis of 1980s where uh, they're not going to be doing those type of things, then I think they will fall nominally. But uh, with inflation, uh, it's a very dangerous Thing that's as uh, Charlie Munger once says, it destroys democracies and society. And if they're not really serious about getting this back down, uh, we got some serious problems in this country. So, uh, with, with quantitative tightening, uh, do you have like a level that you think the balance sheet is going to? <laughs> Honestly, uh, oh, oh, where it's going to? Uh, well, if it uh, if you look at what they did in two thousand and eighteen. 
2019 before I asked Jerome Powell if they were doing QE at the uh, NAVE conference in Colorado. And he said, no, no, everyone. He laughed and he said, no, this is not QE, everybody. Don't worry. This is not QE. It's just a little uh, $80 billion in the repo market, everybody. I'm just going to keep printing $80 billion. Everyone keep calm. And uh, inflation's uh, tame. And uh, the next thing you know, the balance sheet went from four trillion to eight and a half trillion. Uh, so it doubled in in a eighteen month period. But I think when it got down to four trillion, uh, the first time I think it was like a twenty percent decline on their balance sheet. So right now their their balance sheet has only declined, I think, about eight to nine percent, maybe ten percent. Uh, we'll get that those updates uh, today after this debate. So, but. I don't know how low, but they're currently, if you look at the bond auctions on the weekly treasury auctions, the Fed is buying bonds every single week. But what they're doing is they're letting the maturities roll off. Meaning if they had a hundred billion of mature short-term bonds maturing this month, they'll go back into the bond market and they'll buy 50 billion. So the net loss on the balance sheet will show negative 50 billion, but they're still in there supporting lower interest rates because I think actually interest rates should be higher than they are today to tame inflation. So. I don't know. So that's why I'm not really a believer. I think that if the Fed, this is where the Austrian School of Economics comes in. Uh, if we had true free markets, I would absolutely believe that a lot of things would be uh, lower in the future. Uh, but we can never know uh, what the Federal Reserve and, and what the government will do. So, you know, what I would recommend to everyone here listening is to make sure that you have no debt. Make sure that you uh, manage your finances very well and to uh as of right now, uh, T-bills are paying about five and a half percent. That's a nice uh, neutral rate, uh, as Jerome Powell would call it, uh, on the short term scale. But, you know, this is a very, you know, dangerous thing that they're playing with. I don't know if you saw this, but the uh, federal deficit is about to hit 33 trillion. Uh, it was just 31.9 trillion just two months ago. So we're averaging the deficits are now rising at $500 billion a month. So at, at that rate, the deficit is going to increase at six trillion dollars a year at that rate. So, so let's, where's let's that money coming from is is uh, being printed, and that's only going to keep upward prices uh, very high, basically. Appreciate that, Greg. Um, uh, by the way, the people in the comments uh, support you when it comes to uh, not having debt's a good thing. Um, a little bit more concern about how what you're talking about with the with uh, with the overall budget uh, comes down to housing. So, Logan, I will go to you for that. Um, you know, in 2019, I wrote an article saying, you know, we're going to have 71 trillion in debt by 2060. And uh, there's nothing that's going to stop that. This is before COVID. Uh, the laws of big math play out. But uh, to me, the housing market revolves around the 10 year yield since 1971, all the way to 2023. They move around each other. Now, the spreads could be bad, the spreads could be lower. But uh, unless the 10 year yield breaks out, and traditionally, what we saw in the 70s is it broke out with inflation. So if inflation is tame, we could have budget deficits getting 40, 50 trillion. So to me, it, it, it's not relevant until it moves the 10-year yield higher or lower, right? And that's that's all I work off of is that that relationship between the 10-year yield and mortgage rates, everything else to me is somewhat noise at that point. Bond yields fall down, mortgage rates fell down. Bond yields go up, mortgage rates go up. So to me, it's where you think the 10-year yield is going. If we're only focusing on housing economics because the cost of debt, 10-year yield, mortgage rates, that's all that matters. And then again, we are dealing with a society where 42% of homes don't have a mortgage and everyone else has such low total housing costs that uh, are beneficial to them in a sense that they can deal with a lot of situations in the economy. But once you move, you lose that. So the people that are selling their low mortgages right now and buying are obviously doing very well. That matters than a lot of other things uh, uh, that people are talking about in the economy. So it is a much different discussion with debt and credit when we're talking about housing than let's say the federal deficit or anything of that matter. Right. So uh, a lot of times just uh, for listeners, you know, people look at housing as an investment. And now when you look at where the interest rates are today, if you were to borrow today and buy a house today at 7% interest rate and your home only goes up uh, 4% in value. Now, with inflation at 4%, you know, your house is just keeping up with inflation. Now, when everyone was buying their homes in 2020 to 2022, when interest rates were so low, 
when you could borrow at you know 3% and we know that inflation is higher than 3%, that erodes away your debt. So that is, you know, when interest rates were so low during 2020 to 2022, I was actually a housing bull. I was telling everyone and their mother to go out and, and buy a house because just because the interest rates were so low, the lowest actually recorded in not just U.S. history, but in world history. It was never cheaper to borrow money in, in world history. And so that credit boom that happened from 2020 to 2022 is now starting to play out in the opposite side. And I am all for having a mortgage at 3%. I have one that's lower than 3%. That's great because as we were just talking about inflation, it's going to be higher than 4%. So as long as I'm in my home, the inflation is going to erode away my debt. But going back to today, at 7% interest rate and say a 4% inflation rate, it's going to be a lot harder for that inflation to erode away my debt. And there's no guarantee that the interest rates will fall back down to 3% to say refinance in the future. So now you're going to be coming on that housing affordability issue and inflation. And those are because your wages aren't going to be going up at 7% a year. So that 7% interest rate is a really going to, you know, as we know, is freezing up the housing market. And since the Fed's trying to stop inflation, I don't really see the mortgage, the 30-year fix falling below 6% uh, anytime soon. Okay, so let's, um, we have about four minutes here. Um, one thing, uh, some one of the uh, commenters wanted to say is that um, you'd have to factor in rent, Greg. And, you know, if you're, if you're looking at like, you're getting to live in your house, so it's not just an investment. And if you, you know, this is one of Logan's points, I know I'd, um, is that if you sell your house, then where are you going to live? But Logan, I will let you, um, I will let you answer, but no. then I'll give everybody like a two minute where they can do a summary. Um, Greg just made a great case for people and supply not rising, you know, uh, sellers or buyers. And what we saw is that new listings data for three years in a row has been trending at the lowest levels ever. And if you do not get new listings growth, okay, it's very hard for active listings. Like Greg pointed out, uh, uh, your cost to live, your shelter cost, right? Housing is the cost of shelter to your own capacity to own a debt. It's not an investment. People have to live somewhere. And with Greg's premise, he made a great case for in inventory to stay very low. And we've seen this in COVID. We saw this in forbearance. We saw this with the biggest home sale crash. Ever. And in 2023, we're seeing it right now. There is not a financial motive uh, motivation to move unless you can sell your house and buy another one. And people are doing that every single week. My point is that we got to a very low level of sales. And if interest rates fall, like we saw earlier in the year, it stabilizes demand, doesn't even need to grow it. If it stabilizes demand and you have that buyer profile, it's very hard for supply to increase in a big way. If you would need a job loss recession, you need inventory duration uh, with weakness and demand. All these things would have to come into play at that point. We're not there yet. If we get to that point, we'll be able to see it in our in our uh, uh, tracker data. We're just not there. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. I just want to say thank you for having me and I appreciate the debate. And as we start to see the data happen, I really hope we get a more normal recession versus the one that I think can possibly happen, which is something that uh, this country hasn't seen in, in a very long time. So I hope that uh, the Federal Reserve does what they do, uh, doesn't pivot, brings down inflation, we can go back to normal. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then uh, things should be looking on the upside. Thank you both so much. Um, all the comments are like, really, really enjoyed the debate and, and the back and forth. Thanks, Greg, for coming on. Thanks, Logan, for coming on. We talk about these things all the time on the Housing Wire Daily Podcast. So if you're not a listener, you should definitely do that. Logan's on uh, twice, a, uh, twice a month. But thank you both. We're gonna, uh, we're out of time. So thanks for being on and thank you to our listeners.